nice introduction. I appreciate that. You're very kind. And it's so good to be with you, and I'm glad we have the fourth graders here today. The, the, these are all of our fourth graders. Let's give them a moment. See, there's a big, bright object in the back there. And that big, bright object is the sun. And if it wasn't for the sun, there is no way life would exist on this planet. This planet wouldn't exist as it is today. So forecasting the weather really is all about the sun. Creating energy for the future is about the sun. And if you look right there, did you see that? I don't know if you saw that. This was taken about five days ago. Right here, we had a class K solar flare that sent out enough energy that it caused the northern lights to be seen in southern Idaho, Wisconsin, all over the northern part of the United States. It also, if they're strong enough, if we had a, an explosion from the sun, it could knock out all the power grids across the United States. The sun, when it has a lot of activity, you see a lot of sun spots. In 2008, we had a period of time in August when there were no sunspots. And this is the cycle that I'm talking about. Every 11 years, the sun goes through a cycle where it literally, the, mag, the, the, the way that the magnetic fields around the sun work, they switch in direction. And when that happens, we go into no sunspots, and then in 11 years, we go to a lot of sunspots. And then we go back to not very many sunspots. And my conclusion is, is that there's more energy when there are a lot of sunspots. And if you have a time when the sunspots are really putting out a lot of energy, that more of that energy is coming to the Earth. That it could become, it could become a fusion reactor. Very large reactor. 386 billion, billion megawatts of power coming out of the sun. That's a lot of power. Now, if we look at 400 years of sunspot observation, what I want, the thing I want you to notice here, not so much that this is complicated, but the fact is, look at the sunspot activity. A lot less, a little bit more, a lot less. And then, in the 1600s and the 1700s, very few sunspots. And we had a period of time in the 1600s, 1700s, when it was very, very cold. And then we have had a time when it's warmed up a little bit. So my conclusion is, is when there is a lot less sunspot activity, there's less energy. And so that drives the weather on the Earth. And if there's less of the sunspot activity or less energy coming from the sun, then you have colder periods. Now they went back and used carbon dating 10,000 years. And again, look at the sun, how much energy it's putting out. And the one thing that you can see is, it's never constant. It doesn't continue to put out exactly the same amount of energy. It's always changing. And that's the thing that happens with weather. Now Utah's made up of hundreds of microclimates. Wait five minutes, you drive five miles, and the weather is sure to change. Is that true? All right, dreaded lake effect. We have to deal with that along the Wasatch Front. Uh, that's probably the hardest thing for a meteorologist to forecast. It's very difficult. How do we forecast the weather? How accurate are those forecasts? Um, climate change. I don't, like, I don't like the word global warming. I like to call it climate change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that stuff. Um, what's taking place? This is a picture of the uh, Great Salt Lake Effect Storm, October 17th and 18th. That's October, mind you, 1984. It dropped between one and three feet of snow on Salt Lake City. And that was lake effect. Because the waters of the Great Salt Lake cover about 75 by 50 miles. The lake's very shallow, so the temperature of the lake changes very quickly. So if you have a warm period, the lake warms up, and then by physics, as the uh, lake warms up, 
polar air moves over the warmer waters of the Great Salt Lake and it brings the moisture out of the lake and then it goes into the mountains and upslopes, upslopes meaning it goes up into the mountains and that gives us what we call lake effect. You don't have that here in the San Pedro, the Sevier Valleys because there aren't any lakes big enough for it. But there is actually lake effect on Utah Lake and also on Bear Lake. We've seen it. So we use Doppler radar to, to look at the lake effect. And if you look real carefully, you'll see right here a little band of lake effect. And sometimes it forms in big bands and sometimes it forms in just long lines. Here's another one. And uh, in this case, the lake effect, there's no other radar anywhere around here, but the lake effect formed right in the middle of the lake, and then it went right down the middle of the Salt Lake Valley and down towards Orem. And I had someone earlier over here asking me about Riverton. Sometimes the lake effect goes down the west side of the Salt Lake Valley, and, and it storms heavily there. The warmer the water temperature, the higher the chance for lake effect. Most of the time it happens in October to November or March to April. The temperature needs to be 31 degrees colder at 10,000 feet than what the lake temperature is. Okay, this is meteorology. We measure that twice a day when we send up the weather balloon. We know what that temperature is. When it gets colder than 31 degrees, so if the lake is say 40, if it's nine degrees at 10,000 feet, then we start to see lake effect. I just barely got this, uh, this is cool. Um, this is a Snow College G from Weather Station that uh, Ted Olson, he calls the KSL all the time and he gives the weather. And this gives us an idea of what the temperature has done on a graph, shows the current wind direction, it shows uh, Thursday's weather so far. Ted, Ted tells me he's been keeping records for 30 years. So give him a round of applause. records long enough that he can do record highs and record lows for the day. So the record high for the day is 69. The record low is 12. He has a moon rise and a moon set. You should bookmark this. This is really easy. Look at, look at the bookmark. What is it? Can you tell me? It's snow.edu slash weather. It's that easy. Y'all should be looking at this. This is cool. You look at this complicated, difficult to understand stuff. And we come up with a forecast that's easy for you to understand. I can predict accurately for three days. Beyond three days, I'm giving a trend. So whenever you see that seven-day forecast, you say, Dan, why do you put a seven-day forecast up? Why not just do a three-day forecast? Well, guess what? Every single person we talk to says they want two things from us. What's it going to be like tomorrow? And what's it going to be like on the weekend? The only way we can show the weekend is, is putting up a seven-day because it's guaranteed to be there. So that's why we do a seven-day forecast. But honestly, beyond three days, it's, uh, it's a trend. That can cause a lot of damage. And how about the highest mountain wind ever? Snowbird doesn't like us to report this because they, they don't want people to know that the winds blow on top of the mountain that hard, but 124 miles an hour, millions of dollars of damage to homes, business, power lines. It took those big, huge, you ever seen those power poles that are about 80 feet high? It dropped 25 of them like dominoes. Seriously. Um, and that's what it did to a train. This is a picture from that day. It was a cold day, it was, it was snowing, and this train, that was sitting on the tracks was blown over. So that's a bad wind. Those, the easterly winds cause more damage. You're protected here. What's the highest wind, Ted, ever? 69. Was it a thunderstorm wind? Okay. But you don't have a lot. You get south winds here. You get north winds. But you don't get those horrible easterly winds. You're protected because of the Wasatch Plateau. So really, in a lot of ways, those who settled this valley were smart. And the people that live here, you're smart because you live in a place that's kind of protected from severe winds. Although you get your fair share of wind. And you get your bitter winters. And you get very cold in the 